One more announcement, guys, before this podcast begins. This Sunday, Unique Candles has our Christmas horror wax melts, but we've also got the Team Jason candle and the Team Freddy candle coming. Which team are you? Unitacandles.com, Sunday at 6 p.m. Central. Hey now, what's up ladies and gentlemen, people of all walks of life, Christian and Nick, we're back here tonight to do, give you another episode of the Unit Horror Podcast, it's been like two weeks, uh, we normally don't wait this long to do an episode, but you know, shit happens, uh, and we got we got, we got got this guy with us today, some of you might know him, uh, if, if you watch YouTube videos, uh, who, who, who is this, who we got here, Christian, what's his name? We got Mr. Cody Leach, man. A uh, big request oh, yeah. from the viewers. Cody, man, thank you for coming on the show, man. I appreciate it. No problem. I appreciate the invite. I, oh, dude, and I pleasure. don't I don't mean to downplay that. I don't I've been watching Cody for years. You guys know Cody. He's got a big channel. Just past hundred K. That's a big fucking deal. Uh by the way, we play X-rated on here. So you can say whatever the fuck you want. Um yeah, yeah. Uh but how's everybody doing this evening? You guys good? Everything good? Doing well. I'm alive, brother. Yeah, it's good <laughs> enough for yeah. me. Yeah, yeah. It's Friday. Well, so we got yeah. Well, Friday and Saturday are my longest work days. So uh, I, you know, twenty years ago, I love Friday and Saturday, and I fucking hate them. Um, but uh, Cody, I guess a good jumping off point is. I mean, we wanted to do this kind of like interview style. We we pitched a couple ideas of topics, and we felt like uh, they would just come up organically. We know you're. Child's Play and Nightmare Fanatic, those are like your two calling cards. Um, but obviously, you cover anything and everything on your channel. So, like, how did this Got shit you. start? How did this start? Like, how were you, like, were you just like, fuck it, I want to talk to people because nobody in my personal life cares about my taste in movies because that's how I did it. So, uh, that's a sliver of it for sure. I've always kind of felt like I'm on the outskirts. I remember in like grade school, even through junior high, I was always talking movies, I was always going to the new movie every week. and every weekend and it seemed like nobody else was um so i've always kind of had that that a little bit of that feeling especially with horror horror i've never really found anybody uh to where you know, i would mention child's play and like oh yeah i've seen that and i'm like you have oh my god um <laughs> but uh yeah it, the youtube channel just came about i was uh, i was working a construction job uh six years ago and there was a lot of driving involved to where uh, it, it wasn't unusual for me to drive three to six hours a day uh, going to and from places. And so I started listening to music. Eventually, you just got burnt out and listening to the same music. So then I started listening to podcasts and I found myself yelling at my radio because as they're discussing topics and talking about things, I'm like trying to put my input in. I'm like, Fuck, I just want to I want to jump in. Right. And uh, so I went on Amazon, bought a cheap little tabletop microphone, did a podcast for the summer of 2016 and quickly grew out of it. Uh, I didn't want to do YouTube at first because I didn't want to have to learn video editing. I didn't want to learn how to do camera and green screen, whatever else I wanted to do. And it just felt like the podcast wasn't really going anywhere. You know, the only people that were listening was my parents, my wife and a few friends. And so, um, yeah, just one one weekend, I just decided to hell with it. I, I bought a camera, uh, this this Canon camera right here, which is the one that I used up until earlier this year, the entire time I've had my channel, uh, bought that and uh, a little movie called Sausage Party came out and I was like, fuck <laughs> it, you know, what, what better way to start than just pick a random movie. And so I, uh, I, I shot a quick little review. It was like five minutes long, mm -hmm. went and basically locked myself in my bedroom for that entire Saturday to figure out Adobe Premiere and Photoshop and Got a decent enough handle on it, put out my first video and um, kind of the rest is history. I mean, there's been a lot of ups and downs, a lot of learning curves and figuring out I was doing things the wrong way. But that's that's pretty much how the channel started was just me 
wanting to join the conversation, wanting to get my thoughts out there, and uh, the podcast wasn't doing it for me. How long have you been watching YouTube? Were, were you there right when it started? Were you watching like the cool duders back in 2008, seven and stuff like that? Or Yeah, it, it was sometime around 2009. Uh, I had dropped out of college, wasn't working for me, and I moved back home. And I remember that summer specifically, I just randomly came across a Jeremy Johns review. Mm -hmm. And I was like, holy shit, people talk about movies on this thing. Yeah. Like, I don't remember what I thought YouTube was for before then, but it just it never dawned on me. People would talk movies. And so uh, I, I got into Chris Stuckman, got into Jeremy Johns, Cool Duder, a couple of their older stuff back then. And um, I actually had a bit of a false start because sometime around there, I started doing my own YouTube videos, but it was the worst thing ever. Like I just had a little HP laptop with the built in webcam from right. 2009. So you can imagine how much it sucked. And yeah. so it was just me on my couch, like with my leg kicked up and the laptop caddy cornered on my lap with like this double chin angle where I'm like just talking about movies. It was right around the time that the nightmare remake came out. And so mm -hmm. I did a review for that and Halloween two, Rob zombies, Halloween two, a few other things. And I was like, I'm going to do it. And I just stopped for some reason. I was like, eh, whatever. I forgot life moved on. And so I didn't revisit YouTube again until 2015, about a year before, actually, no, 2013, uh, I, I was doing a whole bunch of like acoustic covers and was just putting those on YouTube, just kind of to, to feel like I was getting out of my comfort zone. And unfortunately, when I started the movie YouTube channel, I was trying to rebrand the channel and it ended up deleting all of the things that I had already uploaded. So all 30 of so of those videos from back in the day are just gone into the ether. But yeah, I've had a couple of false starts. That was going to be my question if any of those videos were still available because I love journeying back into the, um, oh, I call yeah. it the wild, wild west days of YouTube. This was before yeah. algorithms and stuff. It's just mm -hmm. everything was word of mouth back then. Uh, do you mm -hmm. miss that sometimes? Do you think playing the algorithm game kind of takes away some creativity? It does. Absolutely. I mean, I, I don't think any anybody who's given YouTube a genuine shot, I don't think that they there's any of them that haven't had that moment to where they dump their heart and soul into a video. And it just bombs. Right. And then on the reverse side of that, they just shit out a video that they have no passion for. And the algorithm grabs a hold of it and just skyrockets it. Like uh, for up until very recently, the the um, the biggest video on my channel for years has been my first Halloween ranking. And it's one of the worst videos on my channel. Uh, it was the first year that I was on YouTube. And I was planning on ranking the Halloween films for a number of reasons. Number one, it was Halloween. Number two, I didn't, I didn't really see anybody doing it at the time. And number three, about half of those movies I hadn't seen. So it was kind of an excuse to finally watch them. And then my daughter was born. And so that plan just went kaput. And so sometime in mid-November, I just kind of threw together this video where you can tell I'm tired because I've been you know, having a newborn in the house. Right. Uh, I'm giving these quick like uninterested unpassionate little pull quote reviews for each movie i'm like eh, it's just it's just bad because like the acting is bad and like it's bad <laughs> and then i just go through it and that was the video that more people than anybody had seen on my channel up until uh less than a year ago my 31 on 31 finally overtook it but yeah um I i've had videos like that and then i've had videos like my top 10 chucky lines where it's just me intro in the video uh -huh. 10 Chucky clips, me outro in the video, zero effort was just something I threw out for fun. And it got like 150 K in a week. And I'm like, what the fuck? Does that ever a question to you? Why do I put all this effort in on all these edits and yeah. getting the right lighting? Is it doing say to yourself? Why, why, why you, you gotta make, you gotta make videos that even yourself probably enjoy too. Right. Is that why we go, is that why we go the extra mile to make, nice edits, make our audio as best as we can. You know, it's like at the end of the day, you almost wonder, does that really matter? Sometimes gonna... it doesn't, but yeah, I, I definitely try to make every video something that I would want to watch. So right. even if it's yeah. more than the topic would really merit, I always try to make sure there's some quality there because you never know who's going to see it and you never know who might have clicked on that video. And that was their first impression. And they're like, this guy fucking sucks. And they first leave. Impression. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> I did like my my Hellraiser 22 review. Uh, the guy that played the chatter room saw my review. And it was like, hey, this is the Cheddarer. Like, thanks for liking our movie. I was like, holy shit. So it mm -hmm. is very true. You never you never know who's going to stumble upon it. And, and that stuff's really cool. Uh, but it's funny that you mentioned Christian 
got a video. Christian's got a video where he was unboxing a good guy doll and uh, mm -hmm. uh, like just showing off his uh, good guy doll. And it's got like over 2 million views, right, Christian? And you have no idea how it got there. It just fucking happened. Well, I have a little bit of an idea. This was before mm -hmm. there was such thing as trick or treat. This was a guy in the UK that I met uh, and he made it. He's It's gorgeous. It's custom made. It's It's got the face from part two where he's got the ruler and stuff. And uh, yeah. it was 2013, 2014. So it was, it, it was, it was kind of a, sh I kind of had a feeling this is going to go pretty viral. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the comments were so negative like they my, I, I this is why i don't put my wife in videos anymore they started calling her fat and uh, my wife and my uh, wife's not even remotely yeah. she's not even remotely fat it doesn't is, matter you know it doesn't it, matter it, she could be a yeah. twig and they're like yeah like, fat yeah. bitch and it just, they like find Chuck any <laughs> any little thing to try to dig at you i, I hear you yeah. <laughs> it, the best the best was like the the cliche lol this is not even this doesn't even look like chucky kill yourself <laughs> but uh. the comments got so bad people think i turn the comments off it doesn't bother me i don't care what happened was there was so many held for review comments that i never approved or disapproved that youtube just turned the comments off because it became so overwhelming the held for reviews that the comments are just off on it <laughs> so yeah um that's awesome so you said you took a big break from around 2009 to when you started up again. What what would what did you do creatively? You said it was the your mu fellow musician, which is cool. Was that what were you doing recordings and all that stuff? Were you putting anything out? Any bands? Anything like that? Unfortunately, no. I think I was just trying to find myself. Honestly, after college didn't work out. Like I, I was somebody that all throughout my life I was just like study, just study, go to college, life will be easy. Right. And, um, you know, unfortunately, I grew up in the generation and it's gotten even worse where that's not exactly the case anymore. And so um, after I left college, it was just like, well, what now do I do the military? Do I just work? Do I? And so that was kind of what I just did. I, I did YouTube a little bit for that summer when I was just kind of back home spinning my wheels. And then I just worked. Um, so I think it, that's kind of what I did. I didn't really do anything creative for a while there, which is part of the reason why. I think whenever it really the creative bug hit me in 2016, that's why it hit me so hard where I'm just listening to podcasts and I'm like, fuck, I could have been, I could have came up with Jeremy and with Chris. Yeah. Like I was there, I was at the the peak and I, if I had just known how the hell to frame a camera. And so, um, yeah, that, that, that was kind of the reason for that. It was just like more important oh. stuff in life just took over and sure, then sure. once everything, once everything got stable, <laughs> met my wife, we moved in, you know, started, having kids and everything. It was like, okay, now we could try it again. Right. Yeah. You guess well, consider you want to go next? Yeah. I was gonna say, consider yourself lucky a little bit. And I, I say this like jokingly because like, you always have those things fondly. Like you can't help it. Like you understand like, Oh, yeah, that time of my life. And you know, it's kind of neat, but Christian and I still have all of our old videos up and believe you me, they are not ones I revisit. Uh, very often. Oh <laughs> Christian and I, <laughs> we, we had a video, we did an episode of the podcast last year where it was literally just an episode. It's like our lowest viewed episode ever, which is wild, but it was just Christian and Nick react to their old videos and Christian would just pull up our old videos and we would laugh at ourselves. And cause it was the same way for me, man. I was, you know, laptop webcam. Uh, and it started with Halloween. Uh, obviously if you can look behind me, I'm, I'm a Halloween guy. That's like my thing. Uh, and Cody and I have had interactions on Twitter over the past few weeks about because you know in 2018, part of me felt like I had a bone to pick with Cody because like he was he was very outspoken about the Halloween community and and how toxic they were being and I was like, you know, I guess I got offended and I was like, we're not like that, Cody. Like, how dare you? But but I was never one of those people that would comment on his videos and say that shit. But I was just like, we're not all. Like that. And then ends comes out and I like Halloween ends and uh, yeah, I need to kill myself. Uh, so. <laughs> You know, it got to a point where, I, I, honestly, yeah, I, it it's pretty fucking toxic. Um, so, kind of playing into that, you're talking. We talked about the algorithm. We talked about obviously as YouTubers, if you want to do, if you want to make any kind of lifestyle out of this, you you do have to play in that some, and it does suck. Um, but having you know, over the past four years, Halloween's been a hot button issue. So, how has that been for you? Being a YouTuber that wants to grow your channel, that wants to get your name out there and make this way of life for yourself while having to cover these movies that really bring out the absolute fucking worst in people. 
Uh, after 2018, I kind of just turned the pistol on them and just used it to my advantage. So like uh, 2018, when the new Halloween came out, like I was really excited, uh, not only just for the movie, but uh, I was going through the Halloween franchise for the first time, which is something that I was planning on doing when I first started my channel. So there was a bit of a full circle element to that. Uh, up to that point, I think it was my best produced material because I was doing like full on skits in the beginning and everything. And I had costumes. I was just going balls out with it. And so whenever 2018 came out, that was kind of going to be like this big breath of relief. Like, oh, the end of this series that's been this you know cool thing I've been building up to. And then I got the response that I got and it became the opposite of what I wanted. And so after that, I just kind of used it to my advantage to where I, I didn't. I never became one of those channels, uh, not that there's anything wrong with those channels, but I never became one of those channels that only talked Halloween and any single update, any set photo, we got to do a whole video on it, anything like that. I would just kind of cover it whenever it came time for a new movie. But rankings, if I had to talk about Halloween or any offshoot topic, if I had to bring up Halloween, I would always kind of throw some humor in there to where I would kind of, you know, dig at everybody that was telling me to go kill myself back in 2018 and all, all the other things that was sent to me. And so I, I think that through the humor, through kind of holding up the mirror and holding the middle finger up to that crowd and also holding true, in my opinion, where I, I haven't really, I, I was never like backed into a corner. We're like, okay, I'm sorry. It's awesome. Four out of five. Like, I was never like that. Yeah. I, I think that it, it worked to my advantage because I noticed in kills and especially at Halloween ends, that um, my reviews were some of the higher performing ones on YouTube uh, in the community. And so I think that because I did go through what I did and because I did kind of hold true and and what I thought was good about it, what I thought was bad about it, and just kind of stayed honest with it, um, that I think think more people were curious of what I had to, um, to say than maybe some channels that they kind of could figure were probably going to be mostly positive or mostly negative, or you could kind of have the mm -hmm. writing on the wall. And so... Um, Luckily, I had a lot of other things, a lot of other franchises, a lot of other projects like 31 on 31 and some other things that I continued to build out my channel to a rate where I never needed Halloween. But um, last year and this year, I definitely got a nice little boost talking about Halloween and a majority of different videos. Um, but I think I just like I said, I kind of turned it and just used it to my advantage and and. Yeah, and I hear you. It, it as a Halloween guy, you know, part of you thinks that you have to almost like lean into that. Well, people know me as a Halloween guy. I talk about Halloween, but I have done. I, I don't. I don't do that. I'm not one of those channels. It's like, oh, a new set photo from Halloween ends. Let's let's do a whole video on it. Like, I never, mm -hmm. I never did that. I talk about a lot of stuff. One of my videos that I'm most proud of is I talked about Mike Flanagan and his career. Career. absolutely love Mike Flanagan. He's my favorite director working today. And um, it just didn't do well. It, it didn't do well at all. And I, you know, I put a lot of time into it and I was very proud of it. But, you know, then you have a Halloween ends review. And even for a channel like mine, you're closing in on a thousand views in, in an hour. I'm like, holy mm -hmm. shit. Like this, this is, you know, people really want with that comes a concept section of 400 comments. And, it gets to a point where it's like, I can't keep up with this shit. But mm -hmm. even with all that, over the past few years, I don't know about you guys, because I know you both did videos on this as well. Terrifier 2, I just did an out of theater short. I didn't do a full review because by the time I got home from the movie, it was after 11. I work in the morning. So I was like, I'll just do an out of the theater short. It's closing up in K. And I'm like, mm -hmm. what the fuck? Like, did you notice, did either of you guys notice your Terrifier 2 stuff do well as, as well? You can go first, Christian. I, I I don't I haven't paid attention. I don't go back and look at my views that often. Can't answer it. <laughs> Very noble. No, <laughs> no. Uh, I I was lucky enough to be able to check out Terrifier two a bit early. I saw it at Fantastic Fest, so I was expecting the video to do very well, and it did. Um, I think the last time I checked, I can actually look at it now. It was somewhere around ninety k. Um, yeah, which it is really good for me. I mean, I've had between September and October, I've had a, a very, very good run, uh, between the movies like, uh, Hellraiser and Terrifier 2 and some things that I was able to see at Fantastic Fest. And then also with Halloween right around the corner, it's at 102 K right now. So yeah, that's definitely one of the, the highest performing just standalone movie reviews I've ever done. Um, and even if I didn't get a chance to see it early, I, uh, just with the way that Terrifier 2 has been such a, 
a, a bigger success story than I would have ever thought. Right. Um, I think it's just one of those movies that is kind of like it has this virality to it to where the first one came out. It, it felt like this viral thing where everybody was talking about it for a little bit, at least within the horror community, but it never really penetrated anywhere else but the horror community. Nobody was talking about Terrifier 2 outside of Facebook groups and message boards and stuff like right. that, it seemed. Terrifier 2, I expected, was probably going to do about the same thing. And then, you know, you have this $250,000 production that is supposed to be like one weekend in horror or in, uh, in the theaters just for the fans. And it does so well, they do it again. And then they do it another weekend. And then they put it out Halloween weekend. And now it's up to like eight, nine million. And they're like, holy shit, man. And so uh, it's it's one of those things where, um, you know, Halloween ends, you expect it to be this this topic that everybody's going to want to talk about. And then Terrifier 2, I think, stole all the thunder from Halloween right. ends to where I hear more people talking about that than they did. Halloween just kind of left, left conversation hey. after one weekend. Uh, Terrifier 2 is the new Halloween. Yeah. And, and dude, I, the only reason I noticed is I don't really go back and look at that either, but down on studio today and uh it showed me like you know your real-time analytics and it was like over the past four hours or, or whatever it is the terror two um out of the fear reaction that's a month old uh was my number one view over the past 24 hours or so and it was like a thousand views over the last day and i was like what the mm. fuck but like it is one of the movies that like just keeps gaining popularity to the point where I'm, part of me kind of worries about the third one because it's like do they, I don't want them to put too much money into it. I don't want them to think too much about it. I don't, I, you know, it's like this kind of really grabbing the audience by the balls right now. And like, that's awesome to see with this just super slasher indie movie. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm thinking about the third one, but yeah, Christian and I, we both loved it. I know you loved it. I did watch your Fantastic Fest review of that and of Hellraiser. And it was a big reason why I'm so excited for Hellraiser to know that, you know, some of the people in the community that I look up to that, and to be fair, you're not somebody, in my opinion, that, that says what people want to hear. I think you're the polar opposite. And that's a good thing. I would agree. I think it's, <laughs> yeah, you're you're very true to yourself. And it's like, if I don't like this, I don't care if it's got a big fan base. I'm going to tell you it fucking sucked. And, like, mm -hmm. and I appreciate that. Um, but also, Christian and I, uh, you're not alone here, Cody. Uh, Christian and I are both big Rob Zombie's Halloween 2 fans. Oh, thank God. So, uh, There's two more of us out there. Yep. <laughs> yeah. yep. Yep. Uh, I'd like to day switch. One. I, I want to switch gears. Uh, you know, Nick did good. We we almost went 20 minutes without mentioning Halloween, which is a good record for Nick. So that's really good. Uh, <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> Cody, I like to I like to get into the mind of like YouTubers and stuff and, and see your thought process. When So when you said when you jump back in in 2016, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people that watch YouTube, I'll, I get this a lot. I'm sure you get it all the time. How do I start? What should I do? Uh, what should I review? Blah, blah, blah. What do you remember when you launched back into it? And do you remember what mistakes you were making? And did you have a plan of action? Do you remember this is what I'm going to do? Or will you fly by the seat of your pants? I'm going to review this today, do this tomorrow. What do you remember about that time? I made all the mistakes. Uh, I kind of just did everything, which is the worst plan to have. You know, you've one of the biggest mistakes, one of the most common mistakes I feel like people make is when they start YouTube, they try to do what all the things that they like. I like the movie live news shows. I like the in-depth reviews. I like video gaming. I like cooking. I like DIY. I'm going to be a hub for all of it. And my channel is right. going to be awesome because of that. And you don't realize that that's not, uh, not to say that maybe somebody hasn't succeeded doing that, but that is the hardest way to go about it because YouTube wants you to be specific. They want you to be niche because if somebody subscribes for your movie reviews, they might not give a shit about your DIY videos and right. vice versa. Uh, and so, yeah, when I started off, I was doing movie reviews. I was doing my own version of like Collider movie talk without going live. I would just film it as if I was doing a live show and have all these graphics and I didn't know how to edit worth shit. And then I, my computer was a dinosaur, so it would take like nine hours to render every video. Right. Uh, I was doing top fives. I was doing video game videos. Uh, and then I, I figured out these things called trailer reactions that I was like, that doesn't seem entertaining to me at all, but okay, I'll try it. And then those videos were just views all the time. And so I was kind of just chasing anything that would work. Um, and I quickly found out that if you're trying to do everything, you're going to succeed at very little. 
And so I started to drop off on a lot of the ideas. The, the first ones to go were the movie news shows just because they took so long to film, so long to edit. Uh, I mean, you're talking about when all is said and done, I was probably putting eight hours into these videos, which sounds asinine to me now right. for 20 views, uh, which at the time was like, fuck yeah, 20. You know, and, and when you start yeah. off, you don't really have any any view is like, hell yeah, you're sitting there refreshing. I got four. So then first casualty was the movie news shows because I was just putting way more time into it than it was worth. Uh, and what I really wanted to do was the movie reviews. That's what I was passionate about. That's what I wanted to be known for. That's what I wanted to really dump my time and energy in. And it was a really hard struggle at first because I had built out most of my subscribers up to that point when I had that little moment of clarity through trailer reactions. And one of the first things I found out about trailer reactions is, yeah, you get a lot of views, you get a lot of subscribers, but they might as well be fake bots because those people don't return. They don't come back to watch your other stuff. Uh, and, and so that's another cautionary tale I've given a lot of up and coming YouTubers is don't fall into that trailer reaction trap. And so right around the time that I decided to do my first full on movie review series, uh, I, I was, I was kind of like, you know, I, I kind of want to do a horror series. That would be fun. Not enough people talk about horror. And so I decided to do nightmare on Elm street. Cause that was my favorite slasher franchise. God bless. And, uh, yeah, right around. I'll say around the Dream Warriors review, uh, maybe even maybe even a little bit after that, because I was still reviewing newer movies as well. I stopped doing trailer reactions, was just reviewing new movies and doing the Freddy series. And I started to notice that my views were getting a lot higher and a lot more consistent on my reviews, which is what I wanted. So I kind of had to like retrain YouTube or retrain my audience to fit what I wanted to do. And so then I just kind of stayed the course with that, eventually moved into Friday the 13th, eventually did Chucky and Texas Chainsaw back to back, uh, still reviewing the newer movies, started doing movie rankings, just kind of stuck with what worked and what I actually was passionate about and trying to kind of hone my craft a bit because, you know, to what you guys were talking about earlier about watching your earlier videos, mm -hmm. like my first handful of movie reviews, I, I cringe when I watch them because I can tell I'm just saying the things that I hear other people say, like I'm using these words, I'm using these terminology. Yeah, where I'm just right. like the cinematography was great and this and that and like my it was just such a it was such a cookie cutter what I've heard other movie review people say. You know, Cody, and so, real quick, it's so funny when you say that. I, I remember telling Nick one time we had we had an episode where I was brought this up and I was like, you know, dude, honestly, what the fuck do any of us know about cinematography? Like seriously, <laughs> like you know. <laughs> The, the, the movie was in focus. Is that is as in depth as we can get about it? <laughs> yeah, the but go camera ahead. was held yeah. still. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, so yeah, the my my first handful of reviews was you know five six minutes long, and I'm just saying a bunch of shit. Like I'm being honest about my opinion, but I'm fluffing it up with a bunch of shit that I barely even know what the fuck I'm talking about. Sure. And so I kind of leaned away from that and started going more into just my personality and letting the personality shine more than. Hey, you should hear me say these big words instead of this other guy that's probably been saying them for 30 years. Right. Um, and so I started doing the skits that I could, used to open up a lot of my reviews with and putting a lot more theatrics into the, the videos and uh, my own brand of humor. And I just started to notice that the more of myself that I put in the video, the more that I kind of made me the star of the show, the better it did. And I would turn some people off, of course, but for the most part that was what people would return for and i'm like well fuck who would have thought youtube you that makes a lot of sense youtube okay let's just <laughs> you're the star of the show we're watching you motherfucker not we're just coming on here to hear other people's words so yeah it, it kind of just took off from there uh, i mean i learned lessons along the way about editing tighter about you know getting the flow of the video getting the thoughts out quicker not having a lot of intro language and stuff like that that's a um, another one that I've kind of done here recently. Um, but yeah, one of the biggest, probably the biggest trap after you, you really get the ball rolling and you start to get some traction, you start to get your groove. The biggest trap to avoid is not knowing how to evolve. Cause I know so many people that they're still making the same exact types of videos, the same exact way today as they were six years ago, seven years ago, four years ago. And then they don't know why they're not gaining traction, why they're not, you know, they're not breaking through the ceiling. 
And um, I mean, even channels that are up in the hundred K's sometimes I see do it. And I'm like, well, I can watch a video from six years ago and it looks exactly the same as the one you released yesterday. Let me ask you, let me ask you this, Cody, going back to what you were talking about with when you started doing nightmare, the nightmare videos, can you kind of, let's like you, let's say you've got your pot here and these ingredients, can you try to help me figure out because Mm -hmm. I think this is what people are really interested in. A lot of people that, and especially YouTubers that watch the show, they want to learn how he did it. I want to know what he did. Can you try to, if you can give me the ingredients on how important, let's say the thumbnail was, uh, the length of the video, uh, the, the stuff like that, the timing of the videos, do you put them out on a certain time of day? What do you recall? If you can remember, did, did were these things that you had in your head like okay so I, I uploaded it at this time this thumbnail had this kind of look to it what do you remember about all of that and what weight you put into all that kind of stuff uh well i would give you a very different answer now than what i gave back when i was doing that first review series because that was kind of my um that, that was my rough draft i guess that was my first go at it and so there's right. a lot of things i would do differently in fact I, at some point i'm not going to say next year in, in fact I would love to hear an announcement of a new nightmare movie that I can plan revisiting and going over doing those reviews again. Sure. We'll uh, speak that into existence. But um, yeah, the thumbnail is extremely important because that's your that's your first sales pitch to everybody is click on this video. It's got what you want. Mm -hmm. And so having some kind of a cool graphic on there, having uh, if you're going to put yourself on there looking like you have a camera that's not a potato um sometimes right. putting some text on there like something i've been doing here very recently over the past six months or so is um when i do a movie review i'll put some kind of a, a quote or some kind of a phrase up in the background like when i reviewed um the northman i don't know if you guys have seen it but it's it's a sure uh, robert Cole eggers movie yeah. uh yeah where you know kind of like lion king uh so i put uh in the little text bar up here above my head i put the lion king on acid the northman review and so things like that <laughs> to where someone's like i'm interested in what the hell that means let me click this video just right. anything that you can do to put together something professional looking but also give them a reason to click yours instead of the 700 videos that are sitting around you and sandwiching you and so the thumbnail is very important and then after that, uh, it's grabbing somebody immediately, which is what I used to really lean into the, the opening skits, trying to make somebody laugh within the first couple of minutes so that they're they're interested in seeing what else is going on. Um, as far as the length of the video, I've always been uh, among the more long winded as far as reviews go. Uh, like I said, my early ones, five, six minutes. And then whenever I started really getting into it, they were like 20 minutes minimum. Uh, and I've kind of it depends on the movie. Sometimes I get all my thoughts out and it's only eight minutes long. Sometimes I'm talking for 25 and I got to cut it back a little bit, but it's really more about the quality of what you're saying. Like, are you just kind of repeating yourself and going over the same points over and over again and being long winded about one point that we, we got in the first sentence, or are you really just having a lot of different things to say about this movie? And for me, it's always worked to my advantage to be longer because there's a ton of videos out there where somebody just kind of, hits bullet points really quick, gets in, gets out. Uh, and you don't really ever really get a feel for that person's taste, how the movie affected them. Is it some kind of a fandom that they've always loved it? Do they just watch it for the first time? And so I always try to have a bit of a story in mind. Why I watched this movie, how I came to this movie. If it's brand new, there's your answer. If it's 40 years old, am I doing a review series? Did somebody recommend it to me? And then I get into all the things about it, uh, positive and negative, and always try to kind of keep the, the ideas fresh, keep the humor fresh, and uh, make sure that I'm not going over the same things over and over again. And um, that's always been, you know, when you're doing reviews specifically, I've always found that. When you're doing things like rankings and everything else, it's just about being very careful not to have a very busy thumbnail, which is very difficult sometimes. If you're ranking... 30 movies or something like that you don't have to find a picture for all 30 just kind of put right. it out there even just putting one word ranking you'll you'll get the point across i used to make a mistake of having to put whole sentences ranking the nightmare on elm street franchise movies like and it's takes up so much that. of the thumbnail yeah yeah so um yeah the, the, there's a lot of things that they all kind of work together in a rhythm you know, you're selling somebody to click the video, then you're selling them to keep watching the video. And then if you're lucky enough that they watch all the way to the end, it's about very quickly 
which I've done a lot better over the past six, seven months than I have in the past, very quickly, almost jarringly. You're like, okay, click this one, please click this next one and get them to stay on your channel because it all just the way that YouTube works, it all works together for what they want. They want you to click. They want you to watch it. They want you to watch more. Yeah. And, and isn't that one of the coolest feelings I've found is um, it's really interesting when you get a notification on your phone or whatever it be, and it's a, it's a comment on a video up, and it's a new name. You don't recognize the the name. So you're like, oh, this is a new person that's come to my channel. Then mm -hmm. a few minutes later, you get another notification, same person, watch another one of your videos. And mm -hmm. then another one on another video. And it's like, holy shit, like they're just going through and watching these. So like that kind of is a nice feeling as a content creator because some people really don't understand like how much time can go into this stuff. Like and and yeah, how the nicest thing that you can do, whether you like what the person had to say or not, is to take the time to watch and, you know, show support. And so, and it's really nice to see those kind of instances where someone's going through your ouvoir and just kind of like commenting, you know, every few minutes on different videos, it goes like, wow, I, a lot of, some people don't hate to hear me talk. That's, that's cool <laughs> because like you, I have been known to be long-winded. And mm -hmm. uh, one of my gifts and my curse is that I really need to do a lot of edits when I'm long-winded like that. I can just go and I can break very easily and go into the next thing very easily without having to go like, um, breathe and stuff like that, which is cool. And a lot of people mm -hmm. have told me that's a good thing, but I'm like, yeah, but that just, it's your nice way of saying, I never shut the fuck up. So like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's about finding that uh, balance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, Christian, I mean, if for anybody, you guys watching, listening, we get comments all the time from you guys and DMs, and I'm sure Cody does too. I've seen him post it on his Instagram story before many times of people asking for advice if they want to start a channel, if, if they want to start a collection, or whatever, whatever it may be. Like, you know, further than a, a guy like Cody who has amassed a very big following and, and his channel is performing at its peak right now. It's, he's, he's firing all cylinders. So, this kind of advice is really good to listen to and take to heart, even for somebody like Christian and I who have smaller channels, but obviously have aspirations to grow. So, uh, I mean, yeah, that's, that's a good line of questioning there, Christian. I should have thought I, of that. Um, I do have a video, too, that I released about two months ago where I just dive into all the things that you were talking about. It's about an hour long uh, where I took a bunch of people's most popular questions about YouTube and just did a whole video kind of categorizing it things to do in youtube things not to do so uh if you are coming to my channel for those answers there's actually a whole video uh where you can find a lot of those things i asked this to we watched a movie i want to ask you the same question which milestone meant the most to you which subscriber number that, that you ever reached because their answer is very interesting which one is the most you were like oh my god this was like the really special one um believe it or not probably either a thousand or 1500 because i i hit 1500 on the day of my one year anniversary uh and youtube when i started it it never never crossed my mind that it would be anything that big i mean i'm always confident in myself and i'm always like i'm an, i'm an entertaining guy you know there's gonna be people out there that'll like me but uh i, I never thought that it would be anywhere close to what it was and so whenever I, especially with you, all the trials and tribulations you go through when you're starting a channel, especially when you don't know a damn thing about what you're doing, like I did to where you're dumping hours and you're dumping your heart and soul into things that go nowhere. And you're just like, dude, how the fuck do people do this? Right. And working a full time job and having a family, like all those things added on. Uh, and so whenever I uh, I'll stick with 1500, but like whenever I, I hit around that spot in my one year. I was like, this might be something like that's a lot of fucking people. It might not be after you're, you know, years in or if you really just sail past that number. But back in the day, you're like 1500 people are watching me. Like, I don't even know what a room full of 1500 people looks like. Right. Uh, and so um, that was a big one where, you know, I, I put a year in. Uh, I had my little dark era where nothing seemed to be working and I was doing everything. And then I started to get my groove and then I was actually getting a following and I was actually kind of feeling like I was a person in the horror community that 
a few people knew my name, like so many things kind of added up around that same time. Uh, and it was kind of all, all upward from there. Uh, like it just, I, I treated it like a job basically from that moment forward. I always had fun with it. The fun always came first. I always tried to make sure I wasn't just doing it for views or subs or numbers. I was always doing it cause I wanted to, and cause there was something I wanted to talk about or have fun with, but I always treated it like a job to where, like, okay, I haven't done a video in a few days. I need to find something. I need to do it. I need to record two or three today so that I can work throughout the week. I need to make sure I watch these movies because this new one's coming out. Like, I, I always treated it like I didn't want to fire myself. You know, if, right. I, if, if, some, if I was running somebody else's YouTube channel, would they be happy with what I'm doing? Or would they be like, I'm getting somebody else? So I always kept that in the back of my mind. And it's only gotten more so uh, as it became my actual career. Um, so yeah, that right about that time is where it really kind of started to seem like this actually could be something. And you, you, relatively, when I look at you, you seem like you grew 30 to 40% faster than a lot of other channels I see. And you strike me as the kind of guy you live in reality, right? You don't mm -hmm. bullshit yourself or anything. Did you ever just say one day when you got to like 20 or 30, did you ever just think to yourself, holy shit, how, I'm pulling this off. Like they're, they're believing this. Like I'm actually doing this. Did you ever have that? Like, <laughs> Suckered cause, cause, them all. <laughs> because, you know, I think we're all our own worst critics anyway. So I, I'm mm -hmm. sure you probably said to yourself, am I really better than X, Y, or Z? I mean, but th they're watching this and, and I'm growing. Like, did, did you ever have that moment? Probably a few times. I mean, there was, um, the first year of YouTube kind of, kind of going along with what I was just talking about too. You know, there was a group of, uh, of other creators that I kind of started along with one of them. I'm, I'm still, um, I mean, I'm still friends with all of them, but one of them I'm still very much involved with, uh, Sean Chandler from Sean Chandler talks about to where we all kind of started at the same time and learn from each other's mistakes and saw each other grow and pass each other and then fall behind and do all these crazy things. And so, there was a lot of moments to where, you know, the, the five, six, seven people that I started with, you know, if it's a race, we're all starting together. And then all of a sudden, two or three of us don't go anywhere. And then it's just, you know, me and three others. And, you know, me and Sean are, have, have, are the only ones of that original group that, first of all, turned it into a career, but then also passed 100,000. And so there was multiple points to where th there's channels that were kicking my ass for a long time for a couple of years where I was like, damn, what are they doing? I need to figure out what they're doing. And then I didn't pay attention to it for a while, did my own thing, built my channel, kept going. And then the thought occurred to me, Hey, I wonder how, what so-and-so is doing. And I look and I pass them. I'm like, what the fuck? What happened? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like all these little, all, all these little moments throughout the past six years to where, um, either passing a channel or, being recognized by somebody i mean just pulling up the true story pulling up to a taco bell drive through with my wife next to me and my kids in the back and the guy hands me my my card back and says i love your channel by the way and the window closes and i'm like what the fuck just happened like weird little things like that to where it's just like holy shit i'm just i'm just a guy filming stuff in, in, in the upstairs room of my 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 house and there's there's you know i'm talking with alex vincent from child's play and i've right. got the director of hellraiser messaging me and, stuff, and it's just like this is fucking crazy and so yeah multiple times over six years where i'm like dude this is this is unreal to this day i'm still i'm like wake me up this isn't true this isn't real it's the matrix and before we go i could say i could tell nick's got something to go but before we switch gears nick let me ask this one question i think you'd actually be interested in this talk about the negatives of getting a channel that grows because it can't all be sunshine and rainbows, right? Oh, you've not. had to have had some trials and tribulations, friendships lost uh, people. You probably, I mean, you, what, when you grow so fast, some people that it could, it could even be people in, in real life that the jealousy, the, the like, Oh, this sucks, but why him? But what talk, talk about the negatives and what you have to prepare yourself for. Yeah, it's not all sunshine and rainbows. I mean, the, the the bigger you are, the more negativity you're going to attract uh, from a lot of different um, a lot of different angles. Uh, luckily for me, the positive always outweighs. Some days it's hard to see that. You know, some days the negative is all you see, and that just that's what takes a hold of you. But it's it that that's something you kind of have to train yourself for is be happy about the hundred positive comments, not the one calling you an asshole who should kill yourself. Um, and so. Yeah, I mean, there, there's been, I mean, I've had people 
uh, not just in Halloween 2018, but I've had other moments where people say some really like just abhorrent stuff. I mean, I had a guy, uh, it was with Halloween 2018, but it's, it's still to this day, the one that sticks out to me the most is that I should have aborted my daughter because of my opinion on a movie. And it's just like, Jesus Christ, man. Uh, so you'll always deal with that. There's no way to avoid it. There's no way to avoid it. There's people on the internet that for whatever reason are just are miserable children with keyboards and they're going to say and do whatever they can. If they decide you're the one today, they're going to say and do whatever they can to try to bring you down. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there's other YouTube channels. Um, you know, I, there was a, a live stream not too long ago earlier this year where it was just three random people together hating on the whole community. Anybody that succeeds saying some disgusting shit, you'll get stuff like that. We are uh, very familiar. Very familiar. Oh yeah. Yeah. So you'll, you'll get things like that out of nowhere where you're just like, dude, like what the fuck, what did I do to deserve that shit? I'm just sitting here. Uh, you'll, you'll have some lost friendships. I mean, you, you know, it, it, unfortunately, I mean, hopefully, hopefully there's some people out there that won't go through that, but you'll have people that you think, you know, that you don't, um, you'll have people that are there for you when you're kind of running on pace with them. And then when you're outpacing them, you kind of start to see the real person. Um, you'll have other people that, you know, even in real life, like if you get a promotion at work, you'll always find out the people that aren't very happy for you. If that happens to you and not to them. Uh, and, and the more, the more popular that your channel gets, the more that you start to become a quote unquote respected opinion. There's people that are out there that don't like the fact that your opinion is respected more than theirs for mm -hmm. whatever reason. Uh, you know, I, I have come across Reddit threads and a bunch of stuff to where not just me, but other channels to where it's just like that person's a piece of shit. Their opinions suck. I don't know why anybody talks to them. And it's just like, why did my opinion suck? It's an opinion. You might not agree with it, but why does it suck more than yours or the next person's? And just there, there's there's always weird, weird, negative things that no matter how fast or how slow you grow, you're just going to come across and be like, wow. That's a side of humanity I wish I wouldn't have found. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's this constant argument that you have all the time as a YouTuber that you eventually get to a point where you just stop ha having the argument with people because it's like we're arguing subjectivity here. Like we're, we're arguing art and art works for everybody in different ways and something may resonate with you and something may not but that doesn't mean that you're right and they're wrong or vice versa so it's just like you get to a point and i, and I really got to that point with hollow Man's, where like i really mm -hmm. i, I love the movie i really really did and you know i a lot of people threatened to take my fan card away uh, i'm not a real fan and it's just like <laughs> i mean watch one of my halloween collect videos and see see the thousands upon thousands of dollars I spent on this series. Like I, I don't need to prove my fandom to anybody, but the, mm -hmm. the movie resonated with me in a way. And I liked that it was different. And you know, it's like, if you did not that's cool, man. Like not every movie can be like Jeepers Creepers Reborn. Although Christian and I were Whoa. easier on that movie because we knew it was going to be garbage, but there are movies that you can objectively say, that's a bad fucking movie. Um, but mm -hmm. Most of the time, it's just subjectivity, man. And it's like, I mean, it, it, to your point, though, about like, you know, the experience you had it at, at the drive through and I'm sure you've had many experiences like that. Like Christian and I, like I, I'm right around 3K. I've only been taking this seriously for about a year and a half. Christian's closing in on 15K. And like, so our channel is considerably smaller, but we went to Scarefest together and, uh, you know, just have one or two guys just be like, hey, guys, like huge fan of the podcast. We're just like, Oh, uh, cool, man. Like we, we really appreciate it. So right. it's, it is a cool feeling. Mm -hmm. It really, really is because I say the same thing all the time. I'm just some pretty horror movie fan that sits in my family room and like record shit. Like I, <laughs> and I don't, <laughs> and I, I always feel subconscious when I'm doing it. Cause it's like, if anybody was here right now, they would be like, he's talking to himself. It's like, no, no, I'm not. I'm talking to people on the internet. No, yeah, I did that once. Uh, yeah, I think it was yeah. on Facebook where it was like, describe what you do for, for work in a bad way. And I was like, I sit in a room by myself and talk to a camera. And then I post the video online so people could watch me talk to myself. <laughs> like, yeah. When you boil it down, yeah. that's really what you're doing. Yep. Let me ask yep. you this. Let me ask you this, Cody. So when I started, I started YouTube 
because I watched a guy named Pizza, which I'm sure you're aware who, who he is. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, I've got he's like a, he's become like my mentor. And I was always blessed that if I had a problem or if I was going through something, he's been doing it longer than me. And I look up to him and he's a friend and I he's my mentor and I, I have I can ask him questions and stuff. Do you have that? Do you have a Pizza, somebody that you can go to if if because there's always somebody no matter who you are, there's always somebody that's been doing it longer or bigger, whatever. Do you have somebody that when you were going through something or you don't know how to deal with something, do you have that person? Uh, to a degree. Um, like I said, uh, me and my buddy, Sean Chandler kind of started together and he, he skyrocketed at one point to where he was passing hundred K going full time. Like back when I was still like 30, 40 K maybe even smaller. And so uh, him and I have always kind of, bounced ideas off of each other or asked each other's questions or hooked each other up with sponsorships like we, we've always maintained that really good friendship to where it, it, even if i was still at 5k I, he's the type of guy that would still do that for me and i would do it for him uh, and so it's uh he, he's very much the guy that i go to whenever um whenever i was going full-time whenever i was debating on going full-time and i was scared to death and i didn't know what i should do uh, he was the one person that i was like hey do you have like a, a little bit of time to to talk and he set aside like an hour and a half and just talk on the phone with me about uh, all the things to kind of keep in mind and making sure I had my head on straight and make sure that you're thinking about this. And um, that phone call is one of the major reasons why I went full time and decided to throw caution to the wind because all of the things that he was bringing up is like, okay, nobody thinks about this. Nobody thinks about this. And I was like, Oh dude, I did. I wrote it down like taxes, like all this weird shit that, is in your distant mind. You're just thinking about paychecks and how I'm going to do, how I'm going to work doing this shit. Like that, that phone call was one of the major um, kind of reassuring conversations where I'm like, I've got this. Like, even if I fail, it's not going to be because of me. Um, so he's very much been that person to me whenever I, I need certain things. Uh, other things, me, me and him are both like, I don't know, dude, we'll try it. We'll see what happens because right. we're we're still kind of learning together as we go too, since we're, we're, we're our channels are about the same age uh, in very different spheres. You know, more horror. He's more blockbuster MCU DC type stuff. So um, luckily, we kind of have that a uh, little bit of a codependent relationship with certain things like that. I'm more dependent than he is. <laughs> so it's got to feel pretty good to have somebody to lean on and not feel like you're alone, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, we we attended the Fantastic Fest together. He lived in Austin. And so I stayed with him, uh, got to meet his family, stayed there for about eight or nine days. And we went through that experience together, met Chris Stuckman together and all that stuff. So it's it, it's been really cool. To, to have somebody like that, that, you know, so many people that I know and still are really good friends with have kind of dropped off or stayed at a certain point in YouTube or left YouTube altogether. And uh, Sean's the only one that I know that is still like full steam ahead the same way that I'm going. So there's, he'll, we'll always have a, a bit of a conversation to be had with each other about what's new in YouTube. What, what, what did you learn today? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go ahead. It, no, it's, it's really nice to, it's really nice to meet these people in person too and find that don't just get along virtually like meeting, mm -hmm. you know, Scarefest was the first time I'd ever met Christian and we've been doing the show for a year and a half. And, you know, I, first time I met Piz and I've been watching him for a decade plus and stuff and meet these people in person. And it's like, Oh, it's just like, it's on. Like we're, you know, we're, we're buddies. Like we have a lot of common interests and, 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 you know, it's not weird or anything like that. So that was nice. But what that people look up to it's funny i did a Halloween three review in 2010 um where when i was still a teenager and uh i was just railing on people like, like it's not a halloween it's not a halloween movie because it doesn't have michael myers and i was like you know just <laughs> going in on people and christian and me that was one of like those videos way back in the day for him that also made him want to start a channel like oh, I, I love the movie too like you know i was talking about this kind of stuff too so it's weird how it changed like Christian kind of looked up to me and then like, I didn't do YouTube for the better part of a decade. Uh, and mm -hmm. Christian has this running joke because I didn't do my Halloween four review for like five years after that. And I said like, all right guys, you know, I'm here to do my Halloween four review. I was sick. Uh, I had bronchitis and Christian's like, we fucking <laughs> got it was over a year. And he's like, sorry guys, yeah. I was sick. I'm like, were you fucking on your deathbed? Like what happened? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like, and it's just weird because like up, 
until a year and a half ago, I didn't take this seriously. Uh, it was just like randomly every few months or a year or so, I would just upload something. And But Christian took it seriously. And, like he gained a pretty sizable following. And I always feel like it's so weird to like not want to see your peers succeed. Like it's mm-hmm. such a weird fucking thing to be like, I, I would never look at Christian's following and be like, God damn it. Like if I would have taken, youtube seriously for a decade i could have a pretty decent following and it's like because i put it in perspective and i'm like i've only been doing it really for a year and a half i'm almost i'm like right at fucking three thousand and i'm like i think of that and i'm like three thousand people like that's a lot of people that watch your stuff like that's pretty cool Mm. and then you get dozens of patrons people want to pay you money every month it's like okay and like so it's 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 really cool to when you put it in perspective but yeah, it's so, so weird. Chris has this saying that I stole from him, which is like, he hates when people big league you. Like, I, mm. I, I'm not, I'm not going to entertain that. You know, you're you're beneath me. Like, luckily, we haven't yeah, I, come across that yet. Uh, that stuff irritates the living fuck out of me because people need to remember where they came from and remember how hard it was when they started and how how reassuring and how how awesome it is it was if you even ever experienced it having somebody that you either looked up to or somebody that was farther in YouTube than you that acknowledged you or did a collab with you or helped you out with anything. I, I, I always uh, try to maintain that. I mean, a, a couple of my best friends that I still do most of my collabs with are. are right around 10 K and I never think of them as the 10 K guys. Like I never think of them as like, Oh, that's, that's the old. Yeah, exactly. I always surround myself with people that I enjoy and that I like, I don't ever, their subscriber count never enters my mind. And, and I always try to use my platform to help those types of channels too. Like I I always get so frustrated and I've, I've voiced my opinion on, on Twitter a number of times to where nothing aggravates me more than when I see channels that are in the hundreds of thousands, even in the millions, and they only prop up their peers that are in the same exact space that they are. Like, uh, I don't remember who it was, but I saw a channel that was you know, somebody on Twitter that's in in the millions. And they're like, what do you think is an underrated channel? And they're like, oh, this channel. And I click that channel and they got three million subscribers. And I'm like, how the fuck is that <laughs> underrated? Like, what the hell? Because your grandma doesn't watch that channel. <laughs> yeah, yet, exactly. Yeah. And so like it, nothing wrong with liking those channels and nothing wrong with helping out your peers. Mm-hmm. But like it frustrates me when you get a chance and somebody's like, what's a good up and coming horror channel? And you don't look at people that are starting out or people that are, you know, still down in the you know lower than 10k or 20k or whatever and so I, i'm always whenever I, I i meet somebody that is newer or up and coming and i like their stuff if i genuinely like their stuff i always try to send them a message like hey i like this or leave a comment or randomly join the live stream and share the live stream or do something yeah. just to lend the help in hand because i remember how invaluable that would have been for me six years ago if somebody it, yeah. was you know, yeah. 100 it was like can hey, we look at your yeah. streams <laughs> can we look at the flip side of that though cody um mm-hmm. do you get people that clearly just want to have you on their show or say hey man you should put me. do you do you see the flip side of that where it's pretty obvious that they're not trying to talk to you it's just hey hey look, i need you to help me out do you oh absolutely lot? absolutely and now, how do you I've, deal with that um i i've gotten an eye to where i can pretty much tell those uh, and uh luckily you know facebook and instagram has this lovely thing called message request so most of them they never see that i see the request in the first place but I, uh, if i if i get the feeling like it's just random guy that i know i've never spoken with i've never interacted with i've never gotten a comment from that just wants me to guest because he thinks me going there is going to get him ten thousand subscribers which it won't by the way that's another big yeah. mistake in youtube um those are the ones that i'll either politely decline or i just won't read the won't accept the message request um i I tend to do that for people that are either they win me over with how they write the message you know that that's all it is really where if if they write it and i can tell this person knows me and actually does watch my channel and has uh, a good reason for me to show up and it's just because they want me to be there just to have a conversation it's not like a sales thing or it's not like hey you're your face on the thumbnail is going to make this skyrocket. If it's not that type of thing, I'm usually way more inclined to show up. And I've actually met a couple of really good friends that way to where sure. um, they wanted me to come do a, a guest spot or come do a, a video on their channel or a collab. And I do it. And then I still 
talk to those people, very good friends with them to this day. Whereas uh, I've gotten a dime a dozen where it's just like, hey, this is my channel. This is my podcast. Do you want to be a guest? Question mark, submit. And I've never heard of this person. I never hear from them again. Um, there, there's definitely that 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 bit of it. Mm-hmm. So it's um, it's up to everybody's kind of kind of judgment, I guess. Which is why when I reached out to you initially, I made sure to like say a message. You know, I've been watching you for a long time. I, I definitely consider mm-hmm. myself a fan, and and you know we uh, we've covered a lot of these bases with a lot of these you know larger horror YouTube channels that we've we've had on here, and it's not. It's not to prop this podcast up because we have a pretty decent base, you know, uh, of followers mm-hmm. that, that watch in the thousands of every episode. But it's it's to give people that like our stuff. They're probably they're probably fans of Wham. They're probably fans of Cody Leach. They're, it's cool to get these guys together virtually and like, oh, these are some of my favorite YouTubers on one panel, like talking. Like that's really fucking cool for them, and it's cool oh, yeah. for us too. People. That- we look up to that we've watched that we kind of aspire to be at times we're like we want to get their brain and we want to we want to talk to them we we never christian and i we don't have a rule about like hey if you come on here you better fucking promo the shit out of it like no come on here we'll post a video if you have the time and you want to share it when it's up awesome if not cool mm-hmm. like we it's never it's never been about that for us but i mean i do have a question for you um my biggest moment for me, my most what the fuck moment while doing YouTube was I was doing a live stream a few months ago and John Campion was watching my live stream and just tipped me $50. And mm-hmm. I thought that it, I thought it was bullshit. And I was like, okay, someone like pretending to be. <laughs> Were you on that whatever. video that he made? Uh, I might have been. I Because they might talked about it on the show that night. I Someone uh-huh. sent me a link. They were like, they're talking about your interaction with John, and I was like, "This isn't John Camp." He comes in the chat again. He goes, "No, it's really me." I'm watching for like minutes, really enjoying your guys' conversation. Didn't mean to hijack your discussion. Like, keep going. Uh-huh. I was like, "This is fucking wild." Like, so I guess <laughs> to to me, what what was that moment for you? Like, what's been the biggest like holy shit moment? Like who? Like someone watching something or commenting or in a live chat? What was the biggest one you can think of? Um, I haven't had one quite that significant. That would have been pretty awesome. I've been, I've been watching John for a long time too. Um, uh, probably it's actually a funny story because it wasn't a positive interaction at first, but it eventually turned very positive. Uh, I don't want to give too many details cause it'll be a long story, but, um, <clears throat> through a series of events, I found out that Alex Vincent who plays Andy in the child's play franchise watched my channel or at least had watched my channel at some point. Um, and, and back when I first started, uh, I really leaned into kind of the rant flavor. If I didn't like a movie, I had to make sure I went extra ranty on it. And, oh uh, one of my videos that got that treatment was cult of Chucky. And, you don't say. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so, um, uh, basically I had ended up finding out later on, uh, that yes, Alex Vincent does know who you are, but he's not the biggest fan of you. And I was like, oh, and just like my heart just sunk to my stomach. And I'm like, what the fuck could I possibly have said? It's been so long since I did that video. And I'm like, I'm scrambling to go watch it. And there's a moment in the video where I talked about his performance and I was a dick. <laughs> and so um, I had reached out to him on Instagram. I kind of swallowed my pride and was just like, dude, I don't know if you're ever going to see this. I don't know if you're going to want to respond. Like, I heard that you weren't appreciative of this. I totally understand why I, I've grown a lot since then. At least I think I've matured a lot. I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. I was young. I was just saying whatever the fuck I thought was entertaining, not caring at all about the, even the, the sliver of a thought that anybody notable was ever going to see this shit uh, and, and kind of clarified everything and got on good ground with him. He luckily responded. We, we, I, I would consider him a friend because I've talked with him numerous times since then um he's he's watched my live streams on the chucky show a number of times and messaged me right after the show and we've talked a little bit so that it has a good ending Mm -hmm. to what could have been a very bad story but uh Mm -hmm. that was the one for me where uh yeah somebody went to go get um a year or so before i found out that he didn't care too much for me at that moment somebody had went to get a picture signed for me and they were like and he knew who you were and i was like holy shit really that's cool and i never 
Never thought anything of it until a year later when somebody completely different was like, did you know that? Uh, did, he, did he give you any clarity on what set him off? Do you, did he, oh, did no, he yeah. tell you? Or? I, I basically said that his performance was terrible and no no question why this guy hasn't acted since whatever year. I, like I was just, yeah, I was, it was rough. And so I watched it and I was just like, oh, fuck, I don't remember saying that. Why did I say that? That's so bad. Um, but yeah, it legitimately like i never deleted the video i have a couple of videos like that back in the day where i'm just like oh man that is not a good look for me but i'm not one to try to hide from the past i like to learn from the past so yeah um, it had a good ending it had a good it ending did. and it that did had a, had a very hey. good ending i'm lucky i very consider myself lucky to uh that he saw the message and that he's a good enough guy to have forgiven that moment in my in my little youtube career and um He's a really good, nice guy that hopefully one time I'll, I'll be able to meet him in person. Because, uh, yeah. yeah, really cool guy. Now, and it's, before it's we interesting. Talk... Oh, go, ahead, go ahead, Nicholas. I, I was going to say this. He was just on the topic of child play. Yeah. And I was just going to say really quick, we uh, we did a live commentary for Seed of Chucky like six months ago or whatever because people had requested it. And, you know, we, we didn't make it to about 20 minutes left in the movie and Christian like he wanted to die and it's it's one of the most epic moments I think on our show's history if Christian just went on this tirade at the end of the episode mm-hmm. and he was like fuck Chucky fuck you to Chucky I'm done you the TV show y'all can fucking have it I'm done with Chucky fuck this shit and like and that's he's a Chucky fan he absolutely is but he's been mm-hmm. so burned by a lot of the decisions that Don Mancini had made yeah. and I'm a David Kirshner, gonna... Tom Holland fan. That's what I am. <laughs> <laughs> so I was going to ask you, Cody, how are you feeling about this TV series? Because I can't lie to you. The first season, I was genuinely surprised. And this second season, I have been like, what the fuck is this? Like, it's it, I, it's it's a mixed bag at best for me. Christian, he hasn't watched either season I'm yet. I'm not watching it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't need to. I'm not interested. I'm pretty much right there with you. Yeah, I, I, I've been Don Mancini's creative ideas are extreme hit or miss with me personally. There's some people that love how wacky and crazy he gets. Uh, there's people that's loving this season of the show. And and that's awesome. You know, he, he's got an audience that loves everything that he does uh, for the most part. He also has people that dislike pretty much everything that he does. For me, he's on again, off again. See the Chucky. I, I do not like that movie. I've given it so many chances. I've tried to let time heal wounds. I've you know, there's certain things that he was going for in that movie that were ahead of its time to a degree uh, with uh, some of the representation and things regarding Glenn that, you know, I try to watch it here recently through a new set of eyes and new generation, new, new cultural uh, thing going on. And I just, I don't think the movie works at all. It's just not for me. Now, curse of Chucky I love. I think that's a great Chucky movie. Fucking very rule. Back to the bear. Uh, back to the basics. Kind of going more to that classic flavor, and then you get Cult of Chucky, which is back into the batshit crazy stuff. And then you get Chucky season one, that's a little bit more serious, a little bit more back to basics, a little bit more classic. And then you get season two, and it's just bad, wacky crazy shit. So he has this pattern where he kind of takes it seriously, yeah. and then goes balls out, and then takes it seriously. And I don't know if that's him trying to navigate criticism and try to appease everybody, or if that's just the way that his creative process works, but it's, it's, it's fascinating how on the dot here, like to a T it's just like crazy one, serious one, crazy one, serious one. And so I'm with you. I had nothing but skepticism for season one. I'm just like, Oh, like, okay. The last one was cult, which I did not like. So uh, already my, my tone is kind of disappointed. What is Chucky going to look like on TV? Is he going to be able to kill? Is he going to be able to swear? Uh, all these questions that I had. And I, with the exception of the finale, I didn't love how the finale came together. I had a really good time with season one. I was like, wow, okay, I'm, I'm here for that. You know, it's, I still probably would prefer a movie in the more serious vein, but this is fun. I can dig this. And season two, it's been to the point where I'm actually considering not covering the show next year week to week because I feel like every single week I'm just saying the same thing. I'm like, well, that was fucking weird. Not really for me. And mm-hmm. uh, it's just throwing all these crazy ideas at the wall. I mean, you, I don't necessarily know if you care about spoilers or not, Christian. Uh, 
Yes I'll, or no? I'll sleep perfectly fine. Go right okay. ahead. So you, you, it, it, by this point in the season, it's very clear this season is essentially like a sequel to Seed of Chucky. It's just trying to legitimize that movie. It's revisiting the characters and the storylines and plot lines that were left hanging from that movie. And now we're going to catch back up with it. And it, it's just very confusing for me. It's frustrating for somebody that doesn't like Seed, but it's also confusing because I just don't know. I would I would love to actually have an honest conversation with Don Mancini as a fan and just be like, dude, what is, what is the deal with the Seed of Chucky stuff? Like, is it something that you, you just genuinely feel so passionate as a creator that you just think that thing is misunderstood and you really love it and you want to lean into it and you're never going to not acknowledge that movie as a part of the canon or is it like a Rob Zombie thing to where you just make whatever you want and don't give a fuck who watches it, who cares? It's this is my movie, this is my series, which I respect. Or is it, you know, you're trying to now that season one performed very well, you're trying to go back and try to do that again and see if you can do it in a way that is more palatable for people. Like, I don't know, but it just seems very strange to me that for a movie that it seems mostly universally despised. There's there is some fans to it. And I know some people that I know one person that's their favorite in the franchise. So there are fans of it. But for the most part, Chucky fans, casual fans and critics do not like that movie. So why do we keep going back to it? It's, it's almost like stubbornness. He, yeah, it's almost like he gets back in our good graces and he does it on purpose. He knows he has to take it seriously again. So he's like, all right, I'll give you guys a, a more toned down approach. And we go, OK, Don. Uh, let me see what you got next. He's like, all right, I won their favor again. Now let's, let's throw a bunch of shit in here. And then people are like, no, Don, I'm not about that. He's like, okay, okay, okay. I'll, I'll tone it down. And it's, yeah, it's, it's just this pattern. And I mean, Christian, you said he doesn't care about spoilers. I just have to say, and then Christian, you can go ahead and ask what you were going to ask. But to what you said, that those last two episodes, the, the dinner party episode, murder mystery mm -hmm. thing, and whatever the fuck the last one was, I genuinely was sitting on there on my couch like, I love Jennifer Tilly and I think she's just bad in this. I think she's bad. And I think that this is just, it's cringy. Like I'm watching it and I'm just like, so many people are overacting and it's so like, like what the fuck am I watching? The, the best thing I can say is a uh, person they got to play Glenn and Glenda. They've been great. I, I really enjoyed their performance. I really think they've been great, but like everybody else, I'm just like, it's only, Switching from the school with the main kids, this shit, it's just kind of like, oh, it gives me whiplash. I i actually fell asleep during episode five. I fell asleep yesterday and woke up at like 10 p.m. I was like, oh, fuck, I fell asleep. Uh, I probably didn't miss much because it just, I, I'm just really struggling, man. I'm really struggling. Yeah, it's really strange because, I mean, we've seen Jennifer Tilly act really well i mean she's an oscar nominated actress i think she's phenomenal in bride of chucky uh and, and she's still yes. really good in seed of chucky despite the fact that i don't like what they're doing with their character and i've had this conversation with my buddy cp numerous numerous times regarding her her uh her performance and i don't know it, it just feels like she's being directed to do that it feels like in all of the tiffany stuff they're just turning the camp dials to like 11 right. and they're like just go big go go crazy act like a ditz and act wild batshit insane all together. And it's so it's like eating one meal, the same meal three times a day for a week when you get to the Tiffany scenes, because it's all just dialed up. There's never a moment of levity. There's never a moment of seriousness. Anytime you cut to that rich ass house that they're in and Glenn and Glenda and, you know, the guest stars, we had Gina Gershon and everybody, it's just a totally different show to where it's all just, wild batshit crazy camp and it, it it's just very strange yeah because it just it feels like the tiffany that we got in bride of chucky is not the same character that we have now no and that was the point i was gonna make is that if they're asking her to overact like that and they're asking her to turn it up tiffany wasn't like that when we were introduced to her so why the fuck yep. is she like this now like bride of chucky is easily one of the best in the series and it's pretty renowned by all the fans like most people love that movie it walked that line perfectly and I just, I don't know. But Christian, sorry to get long. What did you have? The last, the last kind of non movie related thing I wanted to ask was, I was thinking about this a while ago. How important was the family dynamic with going 
full time on YouTube because I could see that in other in a lot of instances just becoming a disaster. I mean, the skepticism about it and things mm -hmm. like that. You don't have to get too personal if you don't want to. But what can you share about like the decision, the, the, sitting the family down and that kind of thing? I mean, it must have been like a big deal. It was. It was. Um, I, I was working a job uh, just under four years is the time I spent at this company. And, um, you know, I, I'm the type of guy to where I really dive in head first into anything that I do, whether it's a new job or it's a hobby like this. Like I put myself into it completely. I'm always the guy that tries to overachieve and, and whatever the expectation is, I'm going to break the expectation. And this is a company that after a couple of years of just feeling like I was going at 150%, it just became clear that they did not care about that. And once that realization came, I was just, I was depressed for a very long time. I would go to bed angry that I had to wake up in the morning and I would wake up depressed that I have to go to this job. And I kind of suffered through it uh, because of my family. You know, once you have a wife and you have kids, you'll put yourself through a lot of shit just to kind of keep everything consistent that you right. normally would not if you were just a single guy. <laughs> You'd be like, okay, fuck you. I'll go work somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um and so after doing that for so long hoping that things would turn around hoping that things would get better at work and all the while i'm maintaining youtube um not really much less than i am right now like obviously i do a lot more now that it's all that i do but i was still putting out three four five videos a week sometimes uh so i was i was maintaining both uh killing myself because i was always tired always exhausted always burnt right but it, it got to a point to where um around the middle of last year, around the, the summertime of last year to where, uh, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to misuse the word because I don't want to, it's a very serious subject that a lot of people are touchy with, but like, I genuinely felt like I was bordering on feeling like suicidal around this job because it was just like, I felt like I was just stuck. Like I can't get out. I can't find a job. that's going to pay like this anywhere else around here. I hate every day of my life. I have to go here. I, I enjoy myself on Saturday and then I'm depressed all day Sunday that my time is coming to a close where I don't have to be at that place. And my wife just saw it on me to where there was nights where I would come home and I would just sit in my bed and just, I don't want to do anything. You hungry? No, I don't want to eat. You want to watch something? No, I don't want to watch anything. And she was the one that suggested it to me. She was like, you, you can't do this anymore. Like you can't, you can't you can't survive like this. It's 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 killing you and it's it's killing all of us because you're you're just like this shell. And so she was the one she's like, like, why don't you, you're succeeding with YouTube? Like whatever you're making now is a pretty good amount of money is pretty successful. And it's just going to be bigger whenever you can dump all of your time and energy into it. And that's the only time where you're happy when you're putting yourself into something and getting something out of it. And so she was the one that was real. I was more reserved than she was. I was more worried about it than she was. She was like, just fucking do it. Like, even it will be fine. We'll figure it out. If it doesn't, you can always get another job. Uh, and so luckily it was actually a very easy conversation because I didn't have to sell her. She had to sell me. Um, my Did you kids, have any preconceived notions on how she was going to, in the back of your mind, had you been thinking about doing it and nervous to talk to her about that kind of thing or? Uh, no, I, I was always, uh, even up to maybe a month or two before I actually went full time. If you asked me, Hey, are you ever going to go full time on YouTube? I would have told you no, because YouTube is very unreliable. Sure. Um, you know, YouTube is always changing rules, changing things with copyright, changing things with monetization. You know, I, I came up in the era to where in the first year I was on YouTube, they got rid of monetization for channels that didn't meet a benchmark. Right. And I was grandfathered in, luckily. But there was, you know, now channels have to get a thousand subscribers and four thousand right. watch hours and everything else. Um, and then they introduced the little yellow monetization button, like all these crazy changes that added in with the fact that, you know, you're, you never know what your paycheck's going to be. You never know what videos are going to succeed, what videos right. are going to bomb. And so, you know, the, the thought terrified me that I could work for a whole week and make really bucks, not not make yeah. shit uh and so I, I was always like no like i'm maintaining it fine with a full-time job that's reliable and my check's reliable I, i'm never going to be at a point where i'm, I'm going to throw caution to the wind and then it was kind of like a rock and a hard place thing and so the only reservation that i had with my wife is because she also has a full-time job and so my biggest worry was are you going to resent me that you have to leave and go to work and come home and I get to sit at home and watch movies and play video games and talk about them on YouTube. Like it, it's still a job, 
but it's a pretty fucking awesome job. Like, is there ever going to be a point to where you look at me as if I'm not pulling my weight or I don't have a real job? Like, that's kind of what my worry was. Um, and I mean, we're a year and a month and change in, and I've never gotten that from her. I've actually gotten quite the opposite to where I'll, I'll show her like, holy fuck, look how much I made this month. Like, look how many, look how many sponsorships I'm getting this month. Look how, look, I got this thing going on. And she's always just like, that's fucking awesome. You know, she was, uh, this past weekend, whenever I was on the cusp of a hundred thousand, she was refreshing and checking the subscriber count more than I was. So, uh, I'm, I'm very lucky that I, I have a wife that's, um, been very supportive and kind of is my, even though she doesn't watch my channel, <laughs> is my biggest fan. <laughs> that, it's good to hear that though, because I we don't see her, so it's always mm -hmm. interesting for me to know the dynamic behind the scenes and how important that is. I think yep. the audience would, would be very interested in hearing about that. So that that's great. Yeah, yeah, it's everything. It makes or breaks it. Like I said, it, it, she would be the the one person. All she would have to do is say no, I'm not comfortable with that, and I would have never done it. I mean, I, I would have never. I would have never been the guy who says, no, you can go to bed worried about whether or not I'm going to have the, the money that we need. I'm just going to go off and have fun. Like I would, I would, you know, she, she was, she was the determining factor and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm lucky that she was the one having to sell me and not the other way around. Does the dad role change at all now that you're, uh, not stay at home is the right term, but because you're home more, does do you have, did she say, oh, now you got to take this one to ballet or you got to oh, do yeah. that, you know? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she got, so she got hers on the back end. Then <laughs> She did. She did. And I can't argue too much with it where she's just like, Shit, I'm going to work. You're going to have to do this. And I'm like, the fuck. I well, okay. Parent yeah, teacher that, that's meetings fair. tonight. So <laughs> yep, you're going. Yep. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. Um, anytime my kids needed anything in school, the first year I would, I would be the one to kind of drop things and go and, you know, I, I pretty much do all the cooking and all the grocery shopping anyway, but I would do that during the day. That wouldn't be something we'd leave to the weekend. Uh, here recently, this year is my first year that my youngest is starting school. And so oh, awesome. Uh, she gets home at um, right about three o'clock. And uh, the older two, I never had to watch. So I could go to the movie theater. They would come home and be totally fine, self-sufficient. But now that's all changed to where somebody's got to be there whenever the bus comes. And so that's that's been my thing is now I'm I'm the one that walks to the bus stop and picks up my daughter and helps her with her homework and gives her a snack. And when she's ornery, tell her to like, okay, you're taking a nap till mom gets home. Like I'm, I'm kind of that, uh, uh, that's fallen on me for the most part, uh, since being able to go full time. So yeah, there, we've, we've had some, some shifts with some things to try to make it, you know, yeah. quote unquote fair. <laughs> fair. Have we had the, uh, take the parent to school day and what is it called career day where the parents show up have we had that moment yet where you get to tell the kids i talk to a camera and people watch me talk to a camera we haven't yeah. but i'm 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 looking forward to it and dreading it at the same time because if anybody's going to do that it's going to be my youngest and i'm like what am i going to be like talking to a bunch of first graders about like yay i have a youtube channel and they go home and watch it and i'm like fuck you the fuck 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 <laughs> it's, just, <laughs> it's one of those things where uh yeah my um uh whenever we did the the orientation this year um right at the end of the summer uh, i was walking the the halls of the, the high school that i graduated from with my oldest who, who just started high school and we were walking mm -hmm. through and uh there was this random kid he's like is that the dad that does twitch and i was like no i'm the dad that does youtube <laughs> is there another dad that does twitch or is that they just i, have, I have a twitch or i had a twitch channel i used to do it here and there uh but uh, yeah my son's much more into video games than he is movies so of course that would be he would be like my dad has a twitch channel and i'm like dude i've got like a hundred people on there talk about the other thing <laughs> no is that a conversation that your your boys had with you like dad like i think i want to do this too and it, do you push him into that sort of thing or is it hey do um, what you want to do no, we haven't had that conversation. And I would, I would be, um, I've always told my wife that whenever my kids are at that point where they have to decide what they want to do, I'm going to try to be supportive of what they, of what they want to do while being very realistic with them. Because I grew up in the era, as I've already said, where my parents were like college, 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 sure. college, nothing else but college. And it wasn't even really true when I was in high school, but it's definitely not true now to where that's right. the only path. I mean, you can go to trade school, you can go in the military, you can do something like this, you can start your own business. I mean, there is so many ways that my kids generation have to make a living that it's it's insane compared to what it used to be. And so um, I've actually 
I've, I've had a cousin of my wife's message me a couple of years ago. And he was like, hey, man, do you think that me and my son could come over and hang out with you for a little while this weekend? I kind of want you to talk to him. And I was like, you want me talk to, to talk to him? Talk to him about what? And then he messaged me. He's like, well, he, he really wants to be a YouTuber and he doesn't want to go to college. He doesn't want to do anything. He just wants to be a YouTuber. And I want you to tell him that that won't work. And I'm like, well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're supposed it, to ask somebody uh, that didn't succeed at yeah, it to do that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so um, it, that would be a conversation to where I would uh, I would even if my kid walked in today and he was like, I don't want to go to college. I want to be a YouTuber. That's what I want to do. I would be like, OK, well, that's fine. But you got to know that's really fucking hard. Like it, it's not easy. I may make it look easy because you've only seen me do it but you don't know all the time and energy that goes into it. You don't know all the times that we've had failures and I've had failures. And uh, there is so many channels out there that have loads more talent than I do that haven't been able to succeed for X, Y, or Z. I mean, I know a channel that started around the same time that I did, I did that has really great thumbnails, has really great production value, looks professional, sounds professional, and he's still sitting at about 1.5K because for whatever fucking reason, YouTube hates this guy's channel and I can never understand it. And there's going to be channels like that. There's going to be people like that. And so it is not a basket that you want to dump all the eggs into. Uh, I, I would if my son asked me that, I would be like, you need to do what I did. You need to find a job. You need to get something stable first. Then dabble into it. And I can teach you, I can kind of guide you, I can do all this stuff. But, um, you know, the, the, the people that people that join YouTube to make it a career or people that join YouTube to get famous, those are the first ones to fail. Join it because you want to do it. Join it right. because you have fun doing it. Join it because it's a nice hobby or it's something that's a creative expression. And if you're fortunate and talented and lucky enough for those things to come later on, then awesome. Right. But I don't know a single person that just started YouTube from day one. It was just like, this is going to be my job that made it. Mm. There you go. All right, Cody, we won't keep you too much longer. Nick, this is where we can, the audience will be upset if we don't talk about some movies. Do you have any direction we want to take Cody in real quick? No, I mean, we covered child's blood. Uh, you know, one of the things he, we covered Halloween and Lord knows the audience will give me shit if you talking about Halloween. Um, <laughs> honestly, Cody, um, uh, I mean, it's probably dream warriors, but what's your favorite nightmare movie? It, definitely dream warriors. I mean, it's, it's close. It's, it's a razor thin difference between dream warriors and the original, but, uh, Dream Warriors has always been the one that I've enjoyed more. That's the one that if I'm in a Freddy mood, I'm grabbing that one True. nine times out of ten. Uh, I just had more fun with it. It's still got the darkness. It's still got the uh, the the dark edge of Freddy. Even when he's given the one liners, they're still he's very still pissed off. Yeah, yeah, they're still dark. It's still dark humor. Uh, and so that one well, to me, it, you know, it's it. There's certainly some things about it that haven't aged well. There's certainly some elements in the third act that could have been done a little bit better, but. Even with that being a reality, it's still a movie that is just, it's endlessly rewatchable for me. Yeah. Oh, I'm with Christian you. I'm, and a, I are fe- I'm a big, I we're Freddy's say, I'm a big Freddy fan. Yeah. I'm a diehard too. <laughs> I got my little baby yeah, Freddy. We're, my- <laughs> we're, that's we're, awesome. yeah, that's his fucking prized possession, his white whale, is that baby Freddy. Uh, yeah. yeah. We're Freddy's Revenge, guys. Uh, that's, that's our favorite and uh for a lot of the reasons why even in your review of it whenever you've talked about it you've always been fair and saying like this is the meanest freddy this is the best look of freddy this and like Mm -hmm. i think that's why we gravitate toward that movie because as christian put it he's the devil in that movie like he's he's just the devil um right would that would that be apt to say yeah, yeah, and uh, the movie certainly has, it's not the most well-made by even a country mile. They reuse shots of Jesse and, and Grady doing those hands, the push-ups when they had different clothes on. Uh, it's technically flawed in some ways, but I just think it has an X factor. You can't really put your finger on it where it's just fucking, I love it. It's, it's scary. It's good. I've come around it. on it a lot more this year than I ever have. It's never been one of my favorites. There's been elements of it that I've always liked, but it's always been very strange 
sure. um, and, and very off kilter and and very unique uh, in, in what I would not have said is a good way. Uh, but here recently, I've, I've been kind of uh, getting my daughter, my youngest daughter into horror because I, I was introduced to horror when I was four years old. You know, all parents have their own different rules. Some parents won't even tell their yeah. kids about horror films until they're, you know, sprouting right. pubic hair. But uh, you have uh, she saw me watching Scream earlier this year whenever I was getting ready to review that franchise for the new film. And she was just like enamored with it. No and for like a month straight, she's like, I want to watch Scream. I want to watch Ghostface. And so it kind of like warmed my heart. I'm like, she's just like I was. <laughs> she just wants to watch all this stuff. Uh, and so I um, over the past couple of months, I've been introducing her to Freddie and Chucky where I'm like, I think you're ready. I think you're ready. How's that going? Big... It's been going very well. She's been yeah. loving Chucky. Uh, she's been uh, she always wants to watch Child's Play 2, which is my favorite. So that's really cool. And when we mm -hmm. watched Seed of Chucky, it was kind of my test. And I think. I don't even think we made it 10 minutes in and she turns to me and she's only uh, she just turned six. So she was five at the time. She turns to me and she goes, "Ew, I don't like Chucky's son. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so I laughed about that. But her favorite Freddy movie is two. God bless. So, her. That's yeah, good. Yeah. so I was just like, yeah. I was like, honey, why this one? Why? And so anytime she wants to watch Freddy, she's like, I'm going to watch Freddy, too. You got the body. I got the brain. And she right. keeps going around the house mm -hmm. saying that. And I'm like, mm -hmm. fine. So I've watched it with her at least three times over the past couple of months and um, fabulous she's brought me on uh, around to it a little bit where I'm like, okay, well, we were talking about Freddie. I... Go ahead, Nick. Go ahead. I was just going to say, we were talking about Freddie. I have got to say Cody has this running thing on his channel. He says it all the time. Anytime he does a ranking, he already knows what I'm going to say. He goes, mm -hmm. I always tell myself, I'm not going to talk about this fucking movie anymore. And then for some reason <laughs> I end up talking about this fucking movie. And it's Freddy's dead. He fucking hates the movie. Christian, Christian enjoys Freddy's dead. I mean, he does. He does. Um, he understands what it is. He, he totally gets it. It's a Looney Tunes cartoon that, but he enjoys it. But yeah, I mean, Cody, you, is that is that your most hated film? Yes, it is. Um, it, it's not the worst movie ever made. There's certainly some worse ones out there, but that's the movie that just kind of chaps my ass the most. Uh, and I and I totally. I, I love the fact that some people love it. I have some friends that are really big fans of it. And look, I, I'm the guy to where I'm not as passionate. I'm not as emotionally involved with the Friday the 13th or the Halloween franchise. And so the oddballs in those franchise, I'm like, I kind of dig this. I kind of like sure. a new beginning. I kind of like Jason X and the sure. hardcore fans look at me like I'm smoking crack. And so uh, that, that I think that's the difference sometimes, sure. not always. Uh, but um, but Freddy's dead for me. I don't know. Like, I, I get what it's going for. They were essentially trying to make like a Looney Tunes cartoon and they succeeded. But it's it's not what you wanted. I get it. Exactly. It's not what you wanted. You know, exactly. And so if, sure. if you're somebody that can kind of dig it for what it is, all the power to you. You know what I mean? It, it, I always try to maintain that for as many people try to tell me that I'm, um, you know, I, I guess stuck up my own ass or if people don't agree with me, I get offended. And I'm like, it's quite the opposite. <laughs> like, I kind of love the fact that everybody has different opinions. Otherwise, this would be really fucking boring out there talking about movies. We'd be like, I agree. Mm -hmm. See you next time. Uh, and so, yeah, Freddy's dead. I don't know. Just like with Seed of Chucky, I've given it so many times uh, to try to warm myself up to it. And just by the time I get to the, the Wizard of Oz scene, I'm just like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's that one. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. No, I think mm -hmm. I think it's cool. You're a big Freddy fan, though. I feel like it's harder for me to find us. You know, I feel like mm -hmm. it's two to one, three to one Halloween uh, nightmare or Friday the thirteenth. So it's always cool when uh, I talk to somebody that's like, "Oh, it's my favorite." You know, oh it's yeah, just me. It's well, so obvious, man. They're so creative. How do you not love them? You know, exactly. That's really cool. That's yeah. Really cool. I mean, when I was when I was four years old, I remember I came home. I've told this story so many times, but like I came home and my dad was watching Child's Play three. And I remember just walking into our apartment and all I saw was the, the molten plastic in the beginning and then child's play three. And I was like, what is this? And I watched it. And just like with my daughter, it was just like this whole new world opened what up. Like, that? what the hell? Like, this isn't what Disney does. And so Chucky introduced me to horror and Freddie made me obsessed with it to mm -hmm. where I I'm, I'm five years old. I, I went to a Christian private school until I was in third grade. And so I'm, I'm a, a kid who is five years old that goes to a Christian private school that wants to watch the dream master before he goes to bed. I mean, it just didn't fit at all. 
And my, you know, my dad's like, don't tell anybody that I let you watch this. And my grandma <laughs> too, don't tell anybody that I let you watch this. And right. I was always, I was always a kid that knew why you don't talk about that kind of stuff at school. But I was also lucky enough to where I was a kid that always knew this was a movie. There's a lot of kids out there and every kid's different to where they just can't handle horror until they get a certain age because it just, it fucks them up. Mm -hmm. And even at four or five years old, I knew what I was watching is, is fake, but it was just, I had a blast with it. Right. And so, yeah, Freddie and Chucky have always been the ones that, uh, you know, I've, I've always held close to the heart. I'm a fan of the other ones for sure, but those are, were later in life. Freddie and Chucky have, have been there since the beginning. Uh, last question for me on, on nightmare. Uh, you, you said you wish that you had some kind of a new movie that way you could, have an excuse i guess to make more nightmare films mm -hmm. if, if that happened what did, what would you be interested in i don't want to see them go the halloween 2018 route and i think that's the re the route they're going to go because it just feels like the the trendy one the most obvious one i mean we've even had heather langen camp here recently articles getting shared around there's a heather langen camp wants to go back for one more with robert anglin uh -huh. I have an unpopular opinion. I don't want to see Robert Englund or Heather Langenkamp or anybody come back again. I think they've had their time. They've given us some awesome movies. Robert Englund said for a couple of decades at this point, ever since Freddy versus Jason, that he's done. Sure. Uh, you know, Jason Blum has gone on record. You know, I'll get him to come back. And I'm just like, why? Like, if he's done, he's done. He, his legacy is fine. He, he's fucking awesome. Goldberg think... paid him enough, though, huh? Huh? Those Goldberg people paid. Oh, yeah. That? Oh, they yeah. Paid him enough. Oh, yeah. There's always an amount you can get. But yeah, I'm of the opinion that if they get a really good script and you get a director that's competent, first of all, but second of all, very passionate about the franchise and wants to do something different with it. And you cast somebody who's either completely or mostly unknown the way that right. Robert Englund was in 84. Sure. As long as the script is good and the actor is good you're going to see a Freddy that you're going to like, like everybody give everybody acts like Jackie Earl Haley was the rule. Like, Nope, it didn't work that one time. And so it'll never work unless it's Robert England. And I'm of the opinion that Jackie Earl Haley did pretty damn good for what he had to work with. He just had shit to work with. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really want to see them start fresh. I don't really want to see beat for beat their original film again, like they did in 2010, but I want to see them start fresh with a new Freddy <laughs> with a new direction and Freddie, if any of them, if any of the big horror icons, Freddie, you have carte blanche. Get your setup and then the kill scenes and the nightmare scenes with all the technology we got nowadays. There's no excuse not to have a movie that's just fucking balls out and just do some things that they could never do in the 80s. Yeah. And so that's what I would prefer. If we have to go back, if we have to do the fucking requel thing and go back i want them to see like a direct sequel to dream warriors you know don't go all the way back to the beginning we've seen that with halloween with candy man with scream just do a sequel to dream warriors and stick with that fantastical element catch up with those characters yeah um damn it my only fear is what you're talking about something new and original i feel like we the sad thing is we, we kind of got it, but it was season that new season of stranger things. Those, those kids who direct the kids, those guys who directed that, mm -hmm. it was pretty obvious that they liked nightmare on Elm street. And it felt like their, uh, their pitch where they're like, all right, give us well, a call. The, Craven that's estate. The, that, that's <laughs> the thing. That's kind of, it was bittersweet because I'm not a big stranger things fan, but I enjoyed that season a lot. And it was great mm -hmm. seeing Robert, right? He's still, he's such a good actor. Oh yeah. And, uh, but I feel like, that was the original Freddy idea we could have, but it was a different character. So it was like bittersweet to me. I feel like that was their movie for a new Elm street, but yeah, yeah. I'm with you. But yeah, just yeah. that that's, that's the one thing I don't like, don't get me wrong. I'm going to be there day one, no matter what I say. And I'm going to hope that it's awesome. And if it's awesome, then I'll be happy with it. But I, I just feel like Freddy's the nightmare on Elm street's the last franchise that needs to just do what the other ones did. I, I want to see it be bold and do something unique like it did back in 1984. Sure. Do you, do you almost kind of wish um, uh, there's been some good Blumhouse movies? Sure. But do you almost kind of wish, like, do you look back on the platinum dunes era and say to yourself, God damn it. You know what? That really wasn't that bad. Do you, you ever kind of think that way? I have a lot of unpopular opinions with that era. I, I love the Texas chainsaw remake. I love the Amityville horror remake. I love the Friday the 13th remake. So, yeah, I really liked a lot of their movies. The Nightmare one, oddly enough, is one of the ones that I dislike the most. But, um, I mean, they were flashier. They were more modern. They were uh, certainly more 
blockbustery than yeah. the the old grimy movies that they're, they're remaking. But I, I dug a lot of what they were doing with Platinum Dunes. Mm. Do you feel like they're doing less damage than this requel Blumhouse stuff now? Like um, it, it was pretty formulaic back then, but it's like now maybe time has made it look a little rosier, you know. But when me and Nick talk about this all the time, we're like, you know what, that Platinum Dunes era, you know what, man, that I kind of miss it. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm all for bold ideas and doing things. It's just uh, Blumhouse in general, I feel like, is more quantity than quality more times mm -hmm. than not. Where they're, I'm, I'm kind of shocked that they're giving up the rights to Halloween and they didn't negotiate something else. I, I would have bet money that Blumhouse was going to end up doing like a bi yearly thing to where one year you get uh, a Halloween canon movie and then the next year they start doing Halloween anthology movies and then just go back and forth like that. Um, you know, he's already talking about wanting to get Friday the 13th, wanting to get Nightmare on Elm Street. I, I hope another studio gets it because I don't want everything to be under one umbrella. Sure. But, uh, you know, we've had a lot of good reboots. I really liked Scream 5. I was a big fan of Candyman, thought they could have ended better, but I, I liked what they did. But, um, you know, even even the Child's Play remake, I'm a bigger fan than most. But uh it's at the point to where, you know, we got to that point at some point where the, the Platinum Dunes era where it was like, OK, how many of these fucking movies are going to are we going to remake? Like, even if there are some good ones on the on the docket, it just felt like Ugh, I've had enough. And I feel like we're at that point with this requel stage to where Halloween did it. Can Candyman did it and so many others are doing it. And it's just like, OK, how many movies are we going to delete everything but the original go back and just call it the same name as the original. And so uh, that's where I'm at with it, where I'm like, okay, time for time for a new era. <laughs> Let's do something yeah, no different. Kidding, right. Yeah. All right. Well, Nick, do you have anywhere else you want to go with Cody before we wrap up? No, I, I think I touched on most, uh, you know, we kept them almost two hours at this point, you know, I feel like, we shouldn't overstay our welcome, Christian. We should, you know, it has flowed nicely. Let's not fucking ruin it. <laughs> let, let, okay, so I'm actually going to ask the last Halloween question. So you like the you like Halloween ends, right? But did you feel like, as a story, it's almost laughable how it doesn't really make any sense, or did you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I'm one of those people where I'm I'm firmly planted in the middle on that one. I totally understand why a lot of diehard Halloween fans are like, what the fuck is this? Why right. were you even thinking about going in this direction? And I also understand a lot of the diehard fans that are like, this is so fresh and unique and cool. I love it. Right. Uh, and I, I'm kind of a both minds and I disagree with both at the same time. I think that um, there's some really interesting ideas and ends. Sure. I like the character of Corey Cunningham. I like the idea of evil taking new shape and evil spreading and, you know, the unlocking evil within people and things like that. There was a lot of interesting ideas that were being explored in the movie, but I think the most interesting ideas in the movie weren't explored enough. And I feel like the movie is of two different creatives to where you have anthology Corey Cunningham people and then you have the we got to wrap up this Laurie and Michael stuff and then the movie just kind of turns on a dime in the last 15 minutes and gets rid of this in favor of this right and so there it felt like they wanted to do a final movie in the trilogy plus their pitch for like an anthology movie but they only could do it in one film so they just did both and it just felt like a really really strange and foolish time to do that storyline when you're trying to conclude a trilogy to where, you know, I've seen the TikToks, I've seen all of the, the condescending arguments where it's like, this has been set up and planned from the beginning. And I'm like, but was it really like, do you have, do you watch Halloween 2018 and be like, you know, I see a Corey Cunningham coming down the pipe here very soon. Uh, it, it's a movie that I like a lot of the bold, unique ideas. It's, I think that it would have made a really interesting story, but it just feels very weird as the concluding chapter of a trilogy to do it then and put the Laurie and Michael shit off to the side and, and, and barely have Michael in the movie and have him get bitched out by a new guy. And just all these things where I'm like, Ooh, I, I watched the movie and that was my only reaction when I did my little theater reaction. I was like, motherfuckers are going to be mad about does. this one. I think I remember that. It's just, yeah, I, I can't recall ever watching I guess for lack of a better term, a trilogy and being like, you know, I, I kind of like some of these movies, but 
they, they don't really they don't really make any sense as a trio. Mm-hmm. It's weird. It's like I've never Jason Blum has done something no other company has ever done where mm-hmm. you can like the movies, but they make zero sense when you put them together. Yeah, it's just I mean, crazy. It, it, it's kind of like what happened with the Star Wars sequel trilogy, to where you're just like, this feels like somebody new came in and started from scratch with every single one of these. <laughs> yeah. I'll be damned. All right, Cody. Well, hey, man, thank you. Really, I appreciate you coming on and giving us, yeah, no giving us your time, man. Um, what's the what do you think the next year looks like for you? Um, well, I don't know. That's the weird thing about hitting 100 K is you're just like, well, what now? Like, I, obviously, it's going to be a long time before I hit a million. That's the next, you know, plaque, I guess. That's the next milestone. But um, uh, I want to finish out the year going uh, finishing out my John Carpenter review series and uh, a couple more new releases that are coming out and then um next year i, I probably want to try to do some some new ideas uh some new ideas for shows or some new ideas for some uh recurring segments uh, i've had some ideas of doing like uh, top 10 of like 1980 and then top 10 of 1981 and doing a series where i go each year and if that succeeds maybe move on to the 90s or the 70s uh, i have an idea for kind of like a, a movie fight movie battle type um uh kind of like a, an essay video where you take like i don't know terminator one and terminator two and do like a really highly produced edited video where you talk mm-hmm. about the pros and cons of each and crown a winner sure. like i want to do something different next year uh, my first year being full-time i kind of just wanted to triple quadruple down on everything that i've done try to improve what i've done and just really just go balls out Right. Um, and now that I've done that, now that I've hit 100K and I've, I've, I've certainly got <clears throat> I've got the, the wheels on the ground as far as just career wise. Uh, I want to I want to try try to do some different things next awesome. year. Have you dove into much of the uh, Italian stuff, the Dario's, Lucio's? I have that? not. Um, that was a big flavor of the week uh, back when I was in Killer Flicks. And so I dove into it years ago, expecting the greatest thing on Earth uh, and. The three that I picked, uh, I started with Suspiria, which is the one that I did like. Mm-hmm. And then I tried to watch Tenebrae, which I did not like. And then I tried to watch um, The Beyond, which I, I kept falling asleep through. So I think I just had a rough start <laughs> getting Those into are Italian horror. Really weird, man. I, it, they're, they're, it's like drinking beer. It's mm-hmm. like you just got to get used to the flavor of it. But I think yeah. I think you'll end up if, if you dip back into it, I think you'll find some stuff that's great. Like Zombie is a classic. The Lucio mm-hmm. Fulci movie and stuff like that. That'd be cool. I remember you you did Maniac, right? That It's not Italian, but uh, mm-hmm. the uh, Joe. Yeah, that's a great one. The stuff like that. I love, too. But awesome, man. Well, that sounds great. Uh, again, Cody, thank you for giving us your time, man. It's uh, great to have you. Congratulations thank on you. the family, the 100K, all that stuff, man. It seems like you're on top of the world. So I know that people are happy to see it. We're happy to see it. So that's awesome, man. I appreciate it very much. And thank you all for right. inviting me. It was fun. Absolutely. Nick, you want to yeah. close this out? Well, guys, that's it. I mean, if you, uh, you, you, I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, will probably already follow Cody. Uh, but if not, We'll put, the, uh, we'll put his list down below. Check out his channel. Uh, obviously, Cody Leach. Uh, we appreciate you guys watching. Uh, we apologize that there was a little bit of a delay in us getting Cody on here and just between episodes. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was uh, it was fun, Cody. It really was. It's uh, it's nice to meet people that you've watched and and you look up to, and they're not dicks. You know, it's it's always nice to find that out because um, sometimes you do worry about. People like are they going to be assholes and uh like we went with mike and jay for over two hours and when we stopped recording when we were like in the virtual green room they were like dude we could have gone for two more hours we like you guys and we we're like that so that that stuff's really cool so uh yeah guys we appreciate it um and uh yeah just subscribe to cody follow us all on social media and uh i don't know keep kicking ass there we go Thank you, you guys. This has been a production of the You Need a Horror Podcast. You need it, we got it. Thank you for listening.